With many outbreaks of infectious disease, and with outbreaks of cholera in particular, there is an inherent social context. Um, these diseases aren't really uh, random events. They're often precipitated by a set of societal factors, and first and foremost, they're brought about by poverty. Uh, each year, between three and five million people contract cholera, and it's responsible for over 100,000 fatalities. And the reason that we think about this Broad Street cholera epidemic in the modern era is because of the work done by this man here, John Snow. He was shocked to find that almost everyone, every one of these vertical lines represented a person who drank water from the Broad Street water pump right here on the corners. And so the local authorities, kind of skeptical of his results, uh, removed the water pump handle so that no one could drink from that water source anymore. And within a few days, the outbreak subsided. So these techniques that John Snow used, uh, which entail finding cases of infectious disease and identifying connections between sick people, these would go on to form the foundation of what we now call epidemiology. CTX phage can bind to TCP and then transport its viral genome into the bacterial cell. Now once this genome has been transported into the cell, it's incorporated into the bacterial DNA. And now, the bacteria can produce virus genes. The virus isn't causing disease in humans. The virus helps the bacterium cause disease in humans. Once the bacteria arrives, it begins producing a protein that's actually coded for by this viral genetic material. And the protein is called cholera toxin. And this cholera toxin is entering these intestinal cells, disrupting their function, and causing them to excrete water into the intestine. And this causes massive diarrhea. So an infected human can produce up to 20 liters of cholera stool each day. And this cholera stool contains trillions of bacteria. And not only does it contain these bacteria, but they've actually somehow been modified by the host environment to make them hyper-infectious and better able to infect other humans. This is, we have very effective treatments for cholera. It starts, and it, most times it actually ends, with rehydration with intravenous fluids. So as long as you can rehydrate someone, they're probably going to make it through cholera. Another way you can help is by giving them this special mixture of cholera salts, uh, which is essentially dehydrated Gatorade. Um, it basically helps restore the electrolyte balance that's often lost with uh, diarrhea. If you can keep a person alive, they'll eventually clear the infection on their own. In 2010, Haiti was struck by a massive earthquake centered just outside of the capital city of Port-au-Prince. And this was an utterly devastating blow to Haiti. It killed over 100,000 people and left millions more homeless. Um, it also caused significant damage to infrastructure, which was severely lacking in Haiti to begin with. Um, so in the wake of this earthquake, uh, essentially millions of Haitians were living in close quarters in places without access to sanitation and without access to clean water. And this is sort of the, the hot zone for a cholera infection. So scientists looking at this situation have three hypotheses as to how cholera could all of a sudden show up in Haiti. The first was that a natural environmental strain, which was not pathogenic to begin with, may have rapidly evolved to become pathogenic in the wake of the earthquake. The second hypothesis was that a pathogenic strain of cholera from somewhere else in the world might have migrated spontaneously and made its way to Haiti to cause the epidemic. And finally, it was possible that uh, cholera was inadvertently introduced to Haiti by human activity. So in order to test these three hypotheses, scientists decided to sequence the genome of the Haitian, pen, uh, the Haitian outbreak strain. And so sequencing the Haitian outbreak strain basically allows us to take the fingerprint of this bacterium. And by taking this fingerprint, we can, the two samples sequenced from Haiti were very, very, very similar to strains uh, sequenced from Asia. Cholera was introduced to Haiti through inadvertent human activity. In the weeks that followed the publishing of this genome and the, the, the release of this data, it was shown that Nepalese aid workers uh, working for the United Nations uh, transferred from a uh, UN base camp basically in Nepal where a cholera outbreak had recently occurred and they seem to have inadvertently introduced cholera to Haiti through a defective sanitation uh, system in their camp. In the wake of the Haitian cholera outbreak, 
there's been a movement to provide vaccin vaccination and also preventative care for any aid workers that might travel from a cholera endemic area to an area at high risk of cholera. The second movement, which addresses your question from earlier, is scientists actually uh, banded together to call for a stockpile of cholera vaccines that could be deployed in the uh, wake of a natural disaster and hopefully head off an outbreak before it happened. Finally, there have been calls for the United Nations to pay reparations to Haiti to basically facilitate rebuilding, rebuilding from this disaster. The only way to truly prevent outbreaks of infectious disease is to be able to uh, address the underlying societal factors which can bring these outbreaks out to begin with. Um, and the best way of doing that was actually constructed in response to the cholera epidemic in Haiti. It's something that's sort of a comprehensive approach. And what I mean by a comprehensive approach is one that balances short-term measures like let's find sick people and treat them to make sure they don't die of this disease with longer term measures like improving access to quality infrastructure like clean drinking water or sanitation systems or the public health infrastructure that uh, can basically make it so even if an outbreak does occur 